Welcome to Restoration Church Online. I'm so glad that you're here. My name is Kurt. I'm one of the pastors here at Restoration Church. Thanks so much for tuning in and joining us today. Uh, we're in week three of If Money Talked, which has been a conversation we've been in uh, where we're letting our money do the talking. And we're discovering that if money actually decided to start giving us financial advice, uh, we really wouldn't be that shocked by anything that it would say, right? It kind of seems to be the expert on the subject. And in fact, if our money could talk, it would probably say things that sound a lot like what Jesus said when he did talk about money 2,000 years ago. Well, like I said, we're in part three, but if you have not yet watched part two yet, eh, please stop. Don't watch this one yet because the conversation that we had last week was just too valuable and too important to miss. And today we're kind of building off of that, talking about how do we leave a legacy with our money, with our resources. But what we're gonna talk about today won't actually be possible unless we first put into practice the principle we discussed last week. So no harm, but just go back if you haven't yet, go to our website or our YouTube page and, and watch last week's message so that you know what we're talking about. Because last week we kind of dove in deep and learned that we aren't actually owners, but in fact, we're actually managers of our money. And that good managers, we always know where all of the master's money goes, right? And so we've spent this last week spying on our money. At least I hope you've spent this week spying on your money. And I hope that it's actually illuminated some things to you that you perhaps didn't even really know about your spending habits. Because according to Jesus, our spending actually tells us something about our hearts. It tells us something about what we value. And we can say that we value a lot of things and often we can fool ourselves because we feel like we value something. But actually our money never lies. And our money will tell us what we actually value by how we spend it. In fact, your money's direction, what you spend it on, where you send your money, it reveals what you care about the most. Jesus said, where your treasure is, where my treasure is, there our hearts will be also. If you've had that experience. When you bought something, you maybe got a new car and you, you always parked it a little bit further away from other people because you didn't want it to get dinged on accident. Well, really the story that leads up to that important saying that Jesus said, Leading up to that, he tells a parable because he was asked a question about inheritance, which in his first century Jewish context, right, this is so important. This wasn't just about getting something after a loved one had passed. This was the legacy of their family. And so he asked Jesus this question, but Jesus' answer kind of surprised him, which is true for many of us when we really listen to what Jesus said. And so we're going to pick this up in Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 16. And let's see if we can learn something from this story. Jesus tells in this parable, and it says, The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And so he thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. He had more coming in than he knew what to do. I mean, this was a really difficult situation, right? And so he thinks to himself, I know, I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And then I'll have a place to store all this surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain lit up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. And everybody's kind of nodding along to Jesus as he tells the story. But then he flips the script and he says, but then God said, you fool. Even this very night, your life will be demanded of you. And what will you have to show for yourself? And he leaves this story with this question. Now, on the surface, it doesn't seem like you and I have anything in common with this lucky farmer. I mean, right, we're not farmers. Uh, most of us don't feel like we're just rolling in it right now. Uh, but below the surface, let me ask you a question. Have you ever had a garage sale? Yeah. Have you ever carried a load or two or 20 to the Salvation Army or to Goodwill? Me too. Have you ever had a hard time finding a place to store something in your attic or at the storage unit because your attic and the storage unit was already full of other stuff that you weren't using anymore. You get the idea, right? You see that, that we actually have more in common with this farmer than it first meets the eye. And, and the farmer, I mean, he had it made. I mean, he was ready to take it easy, retire, eat, drink, and be merry, he says, which is a great plan. I mean, that's, that's the goal many of us are running after, isn't it, right? I mean, that, that's the American dream, right? To have enough money to buy whatever you want now, save enough so you can retire and buy whatever you want later. And if you're really doing it right, you'll even have enough to make sure your kids are taken care of. And, and we could all, you know, want that, right? I mean, that's, you've won at that point. That is so much of what we aim for in our financial world. One might even call ourselves blessed if that was our situation. And that's what everybody in Jesus' audience thought as well. But then Jesus surprised them when he says, that God told this rich, you know, lucky farmer, you're a fool. That's not an aggressive term. It just means 
dude, you're missing it. And everybody in Jesus' audience was taken aback. They were like, wait, what? I mean, he achieved the dream. He was living it. I mean, clearly there must be some disconnect because in that culture, blessing was a sign that you were actually living life God's way. But God asked this rich guy a really important question that he asks really for all of us is, who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And the answer is somebody else. I mean, that, that is always the answer, right? Not, not because this guy specifically in the story was super generous, but it was because he was dead. He didn't invest it. He just left it. And so at this point, Jesus kind of pulls up from the parable and goes kind of 100,000 feet and addresses his audience. And he addresses you and I and this desire that we all have when it comes to our finances as well. And this is what he said. He says, this is how it's going to be. Right? This is how it's going to be for everyone that lives this way where they're, all they're pursuing is more. And he says, everything's going to be left behind. He ate, he drank, he was merry for a time, but then he died. And he had nothing meaningful to show for his life. And this was the mistake that the rich man made. He built bigger barns because he thought it was all for him. And in the end, according to Jesus, it was a total loss. And all of Jesus' audience and probably maybe many of us listening to this story are going, wait, wait, wait. I thought this guy was lucky. Like, what should we do instead? If that's not the way we should live, what do we do? Well, I'm glad you asked, right? And this is why Jesus concludes this parable with an antidote. He says, look, you have to reprioritize. This is the way you thought things were supposed to go. That's actually a better way. And he concludes saying, this is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Because a person without God runs after all these things. But your father, he says, speaking of God, says he knows all that you need. So seek first his kingdom and all those things will be added to you as well. Do you remember in part one what money told us back then? Money said, hey, I can add meaning to your life, but I'm not the meaning of life. That I can add meaning to your life. Like That's the right lens we want to look through. That money actually is a tool. Money can add meaning to our life when we use our money as a tool of adding meaning to life, right? But the rich man in this story, the, the lucky farmer, he never realized this. He thought money was his. And even though in the story Jesus said that the ground was fertile, not that this guy was a particularly skilled farmer, he took the credit anyways. And he didn't see that this was a gift, this was a tool, this was something for him to utilize. He saw it as an entitlement for him to sit back and enjoy it all to himself. But see, Jesus says, when, when you see your money as a tool, it can add meaning, it can add value to our life. Don't miss this, right? Jesus sees our money, my money, your money, as a means, not an end. So often we see it as an end. But if something isn't a means to an end, it has no meaning. That's what it actually means to have meaning. You are a means to some greater end. And the lucky farmer thought that his wealth wasn't a means. It was actually the end. It was for him and, and only himself. And at the end of it, because of that, he had nothing to show for himself but himself. And so even his whole life with all his wealth had no meaning. And when it was gone, Jesus said, man, that's a shame. That was a total loss. The principle we want to look at today, it's, it's as if our money is saying to us, hey, holding on to your money won't change what the future holds. You and I holding on to our money won't change what the future holds. We think it will sometimes. We think that if we just cling to this, we'll be better off no matter what comes. But that's actually not true. And for something, including your life, for something to have meaning, it has to be a means to an end. And so the question we have to ask is, to what ends do you want your life to be a means? I know that sounded confusing. Here's another way to put it. What do you want people to celebrate about you when you're gone? Or another version of that is, what do you want people to line up for and thank you at the end of this season, this year, the time at your job, or your time in your season of parenting? Most of us, we never stop to actually ask that kind of question. Here's the thing, you, you and I, we've figured this out, right? Uh, the, the, our appetites, right, newer, bigger, shinier, you know, that, that's not what we are actually running after. It's nice in the moment, but that's, that's not it. But if we're not careful, that will be the end because that was the means. Culture will move us in that direction, that nobody chooses the, that kind of ending, you know, when they're thinking about it, but we often choose it by accident. And so if we want to have a different story, if we want to have a better legacy, if we want to tell a more beautiful story of our resources, we have to prioritize what we do with our money. 
Because leaving a legacy, actually it requires generating stories instead of just gathering stuff. Leaving a legacy that matters requires generating stories rather than just gathering stuff. And so let's, let's break this down. Let's make this super practical, all right? I wanna talk about the very best way that I've discovered to prioritize financially. And that is to give first, save second, and then live off the rest. To really reprioritize generosity rather than consumption. To take the thing that's usually last on so many of our lists, right, giving, and actually move it to the top of the list. And this is specifically because of what Jesus said, that where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. And so we need to seek first his kingdom, his way, his church. Now, this is the brilliant thing about this statement, right? And it's a principle that actually works both ways. In other words, if you want to change where your heart is, change where the money is going, right? Your, your heart will follow your resources, whether your heart goes first or your money does. And so here's, here's the good news. If you're watching and, and you're not a Christian and you got this far, one, bravo, right? But this is the point in the message where you're maybe going to be glad that you aren't a Christian because here's the hook. You don't have to do this if you don't want to. But if you put this into practice, because there are many people that suggest this exact same thing that Jesus mentions, uh, that if you try this, I promise you, you are going to be thankful. But don't thank me, right? These aren't my words, right? So there are essentially five things that we can do with our money, right? There, there are certainly other categories within this, but essentially there are just five things that you can do with your money. And we all know this. The first one is that you can spend it, right? And we're all very good at doing that. The second thing is that you can actually pay debt with it, depending on how much money that you've already spent or, or perhaps misspent or things that you bought that you no longer utilize. So that's the second thing. You can actually pay your taxes with it, and you should definitely do that. Uh, the fourth thing is that you can save the money. And the fifth thing that you can use your money for is actually to, to give it away, to invest it, to be generous, right? But those are basically the five things that you can do with your money. And for most of us, that's also the order that we actually do them in, right? First thing we do is we spend it. Money comes in, I'm like, I want that thing, I'm gonna go get it. I finally have the money to you know, pay for it. Then maybe we'll pay off some debt. Maybe we'll pay our taxes you know, with the rest when it's tax time, which is now, right? Maybe we'll save a little bit. And if there's anything left over, maybe we'll give it away. Right? But those five things that you can do with your money, you usually do them in that order, at least most people do. Now, I wanna go through that list one more time, but put a little bit of a different spin on it, okay? And so the first thing is obviously when you spend your money, right? that's the number one thing most people do with it. Well, that's for you, we all know that, right? The second thing you can do with your money is pay off debt. And that's actually for former you, right? That, that's, that's you a week ago or a month ago or a couple years ago or back in college. Number three thing you can do for your money, I mean, that's kind of just America and you. I don't want to get into that, but you know, that's kind of the deal. You got to do it, right? The fourth thing you do with your money is to save it. And that's for future you, but it's still for you. And then number five, well, that's where God and others go. And so it's me, 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 God and others in most cases. Perhaps that's how it's done in your home. Perhaps that's how you were raised to spend your money. And again, the problem with that, of course, is that God and others come last. And when we learned last week that we are managers of God's money, we don't want to give the owner of our resources the leftovers. If I haven't spent it all, or I haven't owed it all, or if the government doesn't get, get it all, or if I don't save it for myself later, perhaps God and others will get some. And what I call this is me first living with leftover giving. And that's totally understandable because that, for most of us, if we're honest, that was the script that you inherited. This is what was modeled for us growing up. And this is certainly what culture encourages. But then Jesus showed up and he literally flipped the script upside down. So see, the idea of first is actually really key. Like this idea of what comes first is super important. And I know maybe the idea of seek first God's kingdom throws us off because we're not used to hearing this idea of kingdom. We don't live in a kingdom, right? But, but what Jesus is basically saying is, is here's what matters. In my Father's kingdom, in the kingdom of God, the way God sees the world, it is an others-focused kingdom. It's other people first. And so if you're going to follow me, Jesus would say, it's going to be about doing what's right for others and putting that in priority, doing that first. Throughout his entire ministry, Jesus seemed to teach that what was right for other people, well, that's what was right. What was better for other people, that's what was better. 
And Jesus says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn this idea, this list that you and I have when it comes to how we should allocate our resources, and I want you to flip it on its head and actually do the thing last that you normally would do first and do the thing first that we normally save for last, which is usually giving to God to benefit others. And so it's this idea that Jesus would say of give, save, live, right? Three words, give, save, live. So when you get paid, you invest in eternity first. You give to God's kingdom first, and that is what's going to last the longest. And then secondly, you invest in future you. You invest in yourself, but for down the line by saving a little bit. And then you live and pay off debt and all the things you have to do now, you do that with the rest. You're not not on the list. You're just not first anymore. And I'm telling you, right, this will benefit your financial future no matter where you find yourself financially right now. Whether you feel rich, whether you feel poor, no matter you, whether you feel financially secure or in scarcity, you can take responsibility to actually do this and it will benefit your financial future. This is where financial freedom and financial peace is actually found. The key is to give first, save second, and live off the rest. Now, I know what you're thinking. That's a lot of beads right next to you there, Kurt. What's, what's that gonna do? And I wanna show you what this idea really comes down to because most of the time when we think about it, we think God is trying to take away our money. But actually what he's trying to do is reorient our heart. So let's say that this is actually your paycheck, right? So you see it, it's beautiful, it's full, right? This is your paycheck at the end of the month. If you were to take 10%, Ready for it. Right? We, we actually measured this out that these are actually about 10% of the whole. So even if you were to give 10%, right, that would be what you would give to God. Look how much you have left. Right? And then you take the next 10% for future you to save. To invest in your future or something that may come up unexpectedly. To save for something meaningful or an upgrade on your house. But each month you take the next percentage that you decide, let's say it's 10% for the sake of the illustration, right? Whoops, a little bit got away, right? And let's say you give and you save, right? So you have these two things that go to eternity and go to future you. And then look at how much is left. I mean, we often think, oh my gosh, God is trying to take all of my money. Future me, I can't possibly save for this. I mean, this you know, would really ruin me. But this is the percentages that we're talking about. Even if you gave 10% and saved 10%, that's still for you. This is the rest. This is the 80 that you live on the rest of each paycheck to, to have fun with or to pay your bills or whatever it is that you want to do. This is what we're talking about. But so often we can get stuck because we think God's trying to take it all. In fact, today I was eating lunch with my daughter, Selah, and you know we got a sandwich and some chips. We were just having a great conversation uh, at lunch, literally today before we're filming this message. And we were talking and, and she said, oh, I gotta go get something in case you're gonna get a drink from the other room. And she looked at her plate and I saw her counting her chips. And then she walked away from the table and looked back at me and said, hey dad, don't take any of my chips. And I thought in that moment, who bought you those chips? Like, don't take any of your chips. They're my chips. I bought them for you. You're welcome. You know, and I just, it was just this moment as I was literally like before filming this, it was just a reminder that that's so often how I can see this principle too, right? I, I can so easily be like, oh, but God, you can't take, you can't take my money. And I forget what we talked about last week, that we're actually just managers of his resources, that what he's given to us is a gift and when we give some of it back it not only you know reprioritizes our heart and refocuses who it is that we know our money comes from which will make us more grateful but we will actually be better stewards of the next 80 that we get to live on now so again this idea this give save live idea is actually the key to true financial freedom it's actually the path to financial peace when you give first and save second and then live on the rest right, you actually experience the freedom that Jesus talks about when he talks about money. Now again, I, I want you to not think about a dollar amount, I want you to think about a percentage. Pick a percentage of your income ahead of time, and as soon as you get paid, right, give that percentage away. Because when you choose to put God first in this tangible way, in a way that's meaningful and measurable, in a way that if you're honest, actually feels like it's costing you something at first, 
that is when everything begins to change in our life, right? Jesus was clear, and I know this is, this is tough, right? But it's not my words, so don't get mad at me. This is what Jesus said. That until God is first in your finances, God's not first. Until God is first in my finances, I can't say that God is really first in my life. And I know that this is hard, but our generosity can be a litmus test of our devotion, our willingness to trust God by putting him first in the area of our money. Not just to include him, not to give him leftovers, but to actually put him first. When we do that, there's a promise attached to it. In fact, in the book of Proverbs, who was written by Solomon, who at the time that he was alive, he was the richest man alive, and he's known for being the wisest man who ever lived. So he's got a lot to say on the topic of generosity. He says this in Proverbs eleven twenty four, that the world of the generous gets larger and larger, but the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. And I know, I've experienced this, and I'm sure you have as well. And so what if rather than thinking about our legacy only consisting of money we would leave to future generations, what about we think about our legacy in the intangible ways, right? The ways that we've actually seen money managed when we grew up, the home we were raised in, perhaps that wasn't actually a great legacy. It was full of stress or selfishness or overspending by your parents. And that became really hard for you to then grow a heart of generosity for yourself. But the flip is also true, right? If your kids or your future kids consistently see you prioritize God in your finances, they will not only know that you are serious about God, but they will actually learn how to do that themselves. We've started doing this with our kids when they get a little bit of money, whether because they lost a tooth or they do some chores or we're trying to begin this allowance idea. We have them have three little jars of give, save, and live. And, and, and Sayla is our saver. She has saved every dollar she's ever gotten. And so like, that's a good thing. We're not gonna have to worry about her growing up. Layton, not so much. He might be living with us for a long time, right? But here's this idea, when it comes to legacy, right? Nobody stumbles into this kind of legacy by accident. Listen to me, if you don't decide the ends to which you want your life to be the means, that is the direction that our culture will pull you is towards just spending it all on yourself. So let's take Jesus at his word. Let's actually live in such a way that we do this. We give first, then we save, and then we live. So here's what I want you to do. Starting today, we're starting a 90-day giving challenge. And what I wanna invite you to do is simply this. For the next 90 days, commit to picking a percentage and giving that to God first, to actually take Jesus at his word. Whether you wanna start with 10%, which is a great, again, great benchmark that the Bible talks about, whether you can only do 5% right now or 2%, or if you're currently giving nothing to God, anything is greater than zero, right? Maybe you've been giving 10% for a long time, it's just become a habit for you, but as you're listening to this, you know that God is actually after more than just you checking a box religiously. He wants you to grow in your generosity. So maybe for you, the best step is to grow above 10% for the next 90 days and see how God meets you and see how God moves in your heart. So if you would like to join us for our next 90 days to give God our best, our first, to be a part of this 90 day giving challenge, you can click the link below. If you're watching on restorationchurchsd.com slash live, sign up for it, let's be a part of it. We'll also send you an email this week if you're on our email list. We'd love to invite you to put this into practice and to see if God doesn't show up in your life. You might be thinking, there's no way I could do that, right? There's no way this is possible. But we want you to trust that God will meet you. Just like Jesus said, when you put his kingdom first, God knows everything else that you need and all of that will be added to you as well. You were in good hands when you trust God with your finances. So as we close, here's what I wanna do. I wanna let you know what I think Restoration Church is a great place for you to give to and it has nothing to do with me, right? Here's why this matters, right? If you want to create a legacy, right, where you are putting other people first, where the next generation is valued, you can be a part of the legacy that God is writing through Restoration Church. So get ready to put some of those praise hands emojis in the comments because I wanna let you know that because of your generosity, in 2020 alone, we saw 34 people start a life-giving relationship with Jesus. I mean, that's incredible. Through all that we experienced this last year, that that many people began a relationship with Jesus through our church because of your generosity, just wow. Four of them got baptized. Hundreds of kids experienced Jesus on their level. 86 people discovered their spiritual gift and joined a serving team. 
We walked people through grief, through the loss of a parent, the loss of a child, or the loss of a job. We were able to be the church in their lives. Collectively, as, as Restoration Church, we served over 1,400 hours together in our community, and we invested over $42,000 outside of our church to meet needs of those here in San Diego and around the world. Because as an organization, this is so important, we do this kind of kingdom first living. We give 10% right off the top of what comes in into other places that we see God moving around our city and across the globe. And so I tell you that because we want you to know that we are passionate here at Restoration Church about leaving a legacy about representing God to the next generation or to our skeptical community who need to know that the church isn't just a thing of the past and it's not just about doing the right thing or checking your religious box, but it's a community that believes that God is moving in a new way in us and through us and that we're about making good in the world and empowering all people to love and follow Jesus and that you're invited. So I want you to know that if you want to leave a legacy, Restoration Church is a great investment for you to make. But here's the truth. If we're gonna build a church that's going to reach our community, if we're gonna build a church that has an impact in our lives and the lives of our neighbors, if we're gonna build a church that's gonna have our kids wanting to be a part of it, we're gonna to have to step out of obligation and into a spirit of opportunity when it comes to our generosity because it's gonna take all of us. It, can't, it can no longer be that our church is built off the sacrifices of just a few, but by the participation of everyone. So, so one more time, right? To what ends do you want your life to be a means? What do you want to be true because of how you lived and how you were generous? You need to know the answer to that question before you spend yourself into a position where you can no longer make a difference and address the matters that you actually care about the most. I mean, if you skip that, you're just gonna have your life follow your money and you'll settle for me first living with a little leftover giving and that would be a shame. Jesus would say that's a total loss that you missed out on your potential. But when we embrace and identify how to give and then save and then live, right? when we realize that everything we own is really a tool that God's given us to use to add meaning to our life and to the lives of others around us, well, then it gets a lot more fun. So let's get this right, Restoration Church. Let's listen when money tells us, hey, I can add meaning to your life, but I'm not the meaning of life. Let's remember that we're managers, not owners. And let's remember that we have an opportunity to live in such a way that we can leave a legacy of generosity rather than just piles of stuff behind. Because as money says, holding on to me, holding on to your money doesn't change what the future holds, all right? So will you today decide that for the next 90 days, you're gonna reprioritize your life and reprioritize your finances to put God first and to trust that he will take care of you, to know that it's your job, it's my job, to obey and that it's his job to take care of the details and that when we put him first, not only will it benefit us and create a better future financially, but we will actually discover the peace and the contentment and the freedom that Jesus talked about when he talked about money. And so I wanna encourage you, you can again sign up for our 90 day giving challenge right here on this website. If you're watching on another platform, head over to restorationchurchsd.com slash live Click on that commitment, sign up for the next 90 days, be a part of this with us because we want to see how God is going to move in and through your life as you trust him with your finances. If you already have a percentage in mind, you can actually give right now by going to restorationchurchsd.com slash give. You can set up one time or reoccurring giving. You can grab your cell phone and text any amount in the message to the number 84321. Or you can start by giving via check by mailing it to our building here in San Diego. But however it is you decide to participate and be Restoration Church with us over this next 90 day giving challenge, we want you to know, please sign up so we can be praying for you. We know that this can be scary. We know this can feel like a big challenge at first, but we wanna partner with you and be the church together and believe that we're gonna see God do some incredible things, not just in your life and in your finances, but the next time we celebrate baptisms, the next time we gather in person, when we celebrate Easter in just a couple of weeks and people begin a life-changing relationship with Jesus, you're gonna know you were a part of that in a new way because of your generosity, that you are a part of writing and creating and leaving a legacy through giving here at Restoration Church. 
So we're so grateful for you. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for joining us on this 90 Day Giving Challenge. Before we continue in our worship gathering, I would love to just pray for you because this is a big, big day for so many of us. So let's pray together. God, we open our hands as we pray to you because we want it to symbolize what we desire to be true of our hearts and our souls. We are open to you, open to your way, your kingdom. We want to seek you first and reprioritize our life and our finances. And I know that this can feel scary. I know this is a big challenge. I know there are conversations and, and planning that has to go into this. But the first thing we have to get right is we have to come before you and say, God, we need you. And so for everyone within the sound of my voice right now, whether watching live or streaming later, or listening to the podcast or watching on YouTube, I pray that right where they are, at their desk at work or in their car on the drive or, or just listening on a jog or a walk or just watching it with their family, Holy Spirit, would you be so felt tangibly in that space to remind them that you are their Father and that you want good things for them. And when we trust you, we can trust that we are in good hands. So God, I pray for everyone that's right now debating whether they want to sign up. Would you give them courage? Would they step across the line, join us for the next 90 days to give and see that you would do something incredible in their own life, in their own finances. I pray for those that think this is not for them. That oh, I, I've been given, I'm, I'm good. I pray that they would feel a specific sense of challenge from your spirit right now. That there is something that they can maybe grow in or take a step forward in and that their legacy would be different because of it. God, may we be people here at Restoration Church that leave a legacy. And we do that through our generosity because we know that leaving a legacy that matters, we know that that requires generating stories through our giving and not just using our resources to gather up stuff. May that challenge and change us today. And may San Diego and the world be different because your people said yes to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, again, I'm so glad that you were here. Go to restorationchurchsd.com slash live. If you're not already watching from that platform, click on that uh, link that says 90 Day Giving Challenge. Sign up, be a part of it. Let our team and our servant leaders pray for you, connect with you. We love to help in any way that we can. Uh, we're just so grateful for your generosity and that you're on this journey with us.